think it takes a long time to become a doctor? Well, it's about to get even longer. Dr. Jubal, MedSchoolInsiders.com. Earlier this year, the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, or ACGME, dropped a bombshell. New emergency medicine residency requirements of a four-year or 48-month program across the board starting as soon as July 1st, 2027. For decades, 80% of EM residencies have been three-year programs. So if you're a pre-med just starting out, a medical student applying this cycle, or even an existing EM resident, this is massive. What does this mean for your doctor journey, your finances, and the very landscape of emergency medicine? Let's first start with why these changes are being proposed. The ACGME stated goal is to improve physician preparedness. The review committee looked at what a successful EM curriculum should be based on required experiences, stakeholder feedback, and areas for growth in the specialty. And keep in mind that this rationale is coming from the American Board of Emergency Medicine, which means it's only one side of the story. We cover the controversies later in this video, and as you may have guessed, it involves money. They found that the ideal curriculum, once built out, simply couldn't be accommodated within the traditional 36-month period. They pointed to factors like shorter shifts in EDs nationwide, leading to fewer patient encounters and a need for more time to gain experience. There's also a noted downward trend in the American Board of Emergency Medicine's board pass rates. A survey of EM program directors representing about 60% of all accredited programs indicated an average desired training length of over 43 months, excluding vacation. This new 48-month proposed format is supposed to provide the foundational framework needed for independent practice. That said, this is a complete curriculum redesign for all EM programs. Every institution will need to revise its teaching to fit this new four-year model. It's a complete evolution of EM training. But before we go there, let's break down the core shifts that will define a new four-year EM residency. First, program size and length. This redesign hits at the very core of how programs are structured. Some may need to reduce their resident numbers to meet new requirements. Others with high patient volume might actually expand their total numbers. The minimum program program size will adjust from 18, which is 6 plus 6 plus 6 across 3 years, to 16, which would be 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4 across 4 years to better align with the 4-year length. Next, get ready for more direct patient encounters as the patient volume and acuity will be intensified. The ACGME wants every EM grad to be more battle-tested. They're mandating at least 3,000 annual patient visits per resident tallied across all training sites, and acuity counts a lot. Two, programs must now secure at least 120 critical care patient visits per resident annually. If your program can't hit that mass, you'll need to add on an additional month of critical care rotation to make up the difference. Now, let's talk about the sharp end of the stick procedures. There will be more of them, and they'll be tracked individually. The ACGME is not only beefing up the requirements, but completely overhauling how they're counted. Prepare for new requirements like arthrocentesis, neonatal resuscitation, and regional anesthesia. However, the numbers for some EM procedures have skyrocketed. For example, adult intubations went from 35 to 75, and central venous catheter access went from 20 to 30. The focus is now on leading resuscitations. You'll need to show confidence competence as a team leader for adult medical trauma, pediatric, and even neonatal resuscitation. And this is a big one for POCUS enthusiasts. Point-of-care ultrasound is no longer a numeric procedural requirement. That 150 scan minimum, it's gone. Instead, you'll need competency in performing and interpreting POCUS fully integrated into your curriculum. Every single one of these procedures will now be tracked individually through the ACGME case log system rather than just program averages. Next, there will also be more diverse clinical exposure during training as the ACGME wants you ready for any environment. That means mandatory experience in both high-resource and low-resource emergency departments. However, only shifts supervised by board-certified EM physicians will count toward your core training weeks. Plus, the youngest patients are getting more focus too. You'll now have a minimum of 24 weeks dedicated to pediatrics, including time in a pediatric ED and PICU. You'll also get structured experience in evolving 
fields like telemedicine and observation medicine, as well as a mandatory rotation in toxicology and addiction medicine, and two weeks in obstetrics. Your classroom time will also change. Programs must now plan 240 hours of synchronous didactic content annually, and you, as a resident, must attend at least 170 hours. Every resident must also complete and disseminate a scholarly project. Now, amidst all these changes, there is some positive news for your work-life balance. The ACGME has heard the calls for better fatigue mitigation. The first change is a big win. You can now work no more than six consecutive days in the emergency department. Second, you're guaranteed at least one equivalent period of continuous time off between scheduled EM shifts. Third, the 80-hour weekly limit remains your hard cap, covering all clinical activities, including any moonlighting or work from home. PGY1s still can't moonlight. And finally, you get a minimum of one 24-hour period free per seven days, which cannot be averaged and must be free from all administrative, clinical, and educational activities, including at-home call. While these are certainly steps forward for the profession, it's wild to think that only working six consecutive days in a high-stress job with a maximum of 80 hours a week is a big win. In some specialties, and based on my personal experience in plastic surgery, it's not uncommon for residents to work two weeks straight with no days off. These new bare minimum standards point out just how inhumane residency training is in the US. Working 80 hour weeks doesn't train you to be a better doctor. In fact, your information retention goes down when you're sleep deprived, overworked, and burnt out. The unfortunate truth is there's clear financial incentive for hospitals to extract as much value out of cheap labor residents as they can. But before we go any further, it's important to note that there are a number of caveats to these changes. On paper, more training, more procedures, and more diverse experience sound great, but this extended training comes with significant costs. Let's talk about the elephant in the room, the financial burden. As a medical student or current resident, you're already facing monumental student loan debt averaging about $260,000 for med school graduates. An extra year of residency means another year of living on a resident salary, which averages around $67,400, whereas an EM attending salary averages at nearly $400,000. At an approximate loss of $330,000, that's a staggering financial hit. Additionally, it's one more year of interest accrued on any medical student debt you might have. When accounting for hours worked, many residents earn less than some retail staff despite years of training and mountains of debt, and this additional year of residency exacerbates that pinch. In fact, one study showed that hospitals can actually generate a slush fund after a resident's third year due to their increased productivity. It begs the question, is this about better training or is it another year of cheap labor? Then there's the question of competency. Does EM really need an extra year? Many argue that three-year EM programs have been successfully producing competency competent board-certified physicians for decades. Anecdotal evidence and even some publications suggest there's no substantial difference in residents completing a three- or four-year program when it comes to skills or board scores. Dr. Amy Ho, an EM physician, pointed out that the caliber of the program might be a larger factor in resident preparedness than simply its length. If the goal is stronger doctors, shouldn't the focus be on improving the quality of existing programs rather than simply extending everyone's training? And this leads directly into a potential workforce crisis. If you add a year to the training, you essentially create a gap year in 2030. That's the year when the three-year programs would have graduated. This means thousands fewer EM doctors entering the workforce in 2030, which could have some serious ripple effects. Adding to this shortage is the strong potential that fewer students students will apply to EM if the training length is increased, as it lowers the appeal of emergency medicine. If someone is looking for a three-year program, the prospect of another year of training and the financial burden that comes with it may be enough to sway them to a different three-year residency option, like family medicine or internal medicine. While only one factor, residency length contributes to a specialty's appeal. Ultimately, a longer program makes emergency medicine less desirable, resulting in fewer candidates. There's a real 
concern that changes could lead to a shrinkage in the EM applicant pool. For rural areas, this could be devastating. Also, this mandatory four-year extension, perceived by many as an additional year of undervalued labor, could intensify the drive for resident unionization. When the individual has no bargaining power, collective action becomes a compelling alternative. This change may add fuel to an already growing fire. We've covered the nuances of physician unionization before on this channel, link in the description. So what does this mean for you, whether you're a pre-med or already on your EM journey? If you're a pre-med or med student, understand that EM will be a longer commitment. If EM is your passion, you'll adapt, but consider the added financial and time investment. This might shift your decision if you're on the fence between EM and another specialty. Research programs carefully. Look for those that demonstrate a strong commitment to resident well-being and high-quality, efficient training within this new framework. And keep in mind that financial planning is paramount. With an extra year of resident salary and delayed attending income, it's more important than ever to have a solid financial plan. Focus on debt management and look into strategies to mitigate interest accumulation. If you're currently an EM resident, look up your program-specific transition plan as these new requirements, especially the procedural counts and site experiences, will impact your remaining years. But keep in mind that those six consecutive day limits and protected 24-hour off periods are significant wins when it comes to your work-life balance. What do you think? Will the added training lead to more effective EM doctors, or is this more about securing another year of cheap resident labor? Share your thoughts in the comments below. For a deeper look into the dark side of residency, check out our video right up here on the US House Panel's investigation into the MATCH system.